Cloud. I miss Excellent. the productive voice. I know, I know, me too. Um, welcome to the Rex call for Wednesday, January 10th, 2018, our first call of 2018. It seems kind of strange that we're in 2018. I look at the number and I'm like, how did we get to 2018 so fast? How did, how did this even happen? Um, but welcome to the new year. I uh, will start us off with a poem titled, You and Your Ilk, <clears throat> which uh, has a bit to do with today's topic. Uh, it's written by Thomas Lux and goes as follows. You and Your Ilk. I have thought much upon who might be my ilk and that I am ilk myself if I have ilk. Is one of my ilk or me the barber who cuts the hair of the blind and the man crushed by cruelties for which we can't imagine sorrow? Who, who would be his ilk? And whose ilk was it standing around hands in pockets May 1933 when 2,242 tons of books were burned? Not mine. So what makes my ilkness my ilkness? No answers, none forthcoming. To be one of the ilks, that's all I hope for. To say hello to the mailman, nod to my neighbors, to watch my children climb the stairs of a big yellow bus which takes them to a place where they learn to read and write and eat their lunches from puzzle trays. All around them, amid the clatter and din, amid bananas, bread and milk, all around them, them and their ilk. So I'll, I'll, I'll read it again. I like, it's, it's just a sweet poem. <clears throat> you and Your Ilk by Thomas Lux. I have thought much upon who might be my ilk and that I am ilk myself if I have ilk. Is one of my ilk or me the barber who cuts the hair of the blind and the man crushed by cruelties for which we can't imagine sorrow? Who would be his ilk? And whose ilk was it standing around hands in pockets May 1933 when 2,242 tons of books were burned? Not mine. So what makes my ilkness my ilkness? No answers, none forthcoming. To be one of the ilks, that's all I hope for, to say hello to the mailman, nod to my neighbors, to watch my children climb the stairs of a big yellow bus, which takes them to a place where they read, learn to read and write and eat their lunches from puzzle trays, all around them, amid the clatter and din, amid bananas, bread, and milk, all around them, them and their ilk. Welcome to 2018. We have a, a topic in front of us about, about building real relationships, about listening, about other sorts of things. Uh, ha had any of you already run across uh, the author of the video that I sent out, Anand Jiridharadas? Have you, had you seen any of his work already? Anybody? No. Nobody. Okay. Because um, I had run across the, the the second the extra credit video that I that I sent uh, in the invite. I had seen that one a while ago, and it blew it blew my mind. He he basically went <clears throat> to a regular meeting of I think it was Aspen Institute, where he was a fellow and met all his fellows, and he's like, "You guys are like my family. This is so cool, and we are the problem." And he then he then very directly looked at them and said. Uh, the fact that we sort of meet here in a friendly way and think that we're doing something you know, reasonable and good to help the world is, is maybe part of the problem uh, in an interesting way. And then in this, in this new talk, uh, his letter of apology, um, he's doing the same sort of thing. I mean, I, I think what I appreciate about uh, Anand is the, the depth of introspection uh, and the willingness to sort of take some responsibility for what's clearly broken out there and to put words around it in a way that I hadn't, hadn't thought about putting words. Um, any, anyone have sort of a, a reaction to, um, uh, to how this, how, how did this roll for any of you? Was it, uh, I don't know. Um, Mark, you're, you're muted. Do you want to say a little bit about what, uh, what it felt like? Oh, no, I was waving to April. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought that was a comment. <laughs> Jerry, the, <clears throat> this is Bill. Can you hear me? Yes, here you find. Um, I, I, I've been struggling with this whole issue because of the fact that it inter, inter, interlaces with our interest in trying to find like a Trump town that we can go into and try and sort of explore ways to create jobs, to create community and all this kind of stuff. And in preparation for that, I've been watching YouTube interviews with Trump followers. 
and the, the material that you sent really sort of gave a little bit more of the background of where that comes from. And, and yet I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm still struggling to find any way of perceiving of being able to jump over that gap. In other words, in listening to Trump followers, they, and, and somebody, I think somebody associated with the Dalai Lama uh, articulated this with the, the word contempt. In other words, there's a level of contempt that's being expressed by the Trump followers that bears no, you know, has no opening for dialogue. In other words, they literally, like in this particular situation, it was around the, the, the Roy Moore situation. Mm. The, the, the whites were like, these, these blacks are so stupid. They've never gotten anything, excuse me, because they've never been, you know, the, the Democrats can't get anything for them, but they've never gotten anything. They keep voting for them. They should vote with us. They're too stupid. Now, it, 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 that kind of contempt is hard to overcome. In other words, mm -hmm. it doesn't, it, in, in fact, they almost rile at the idea of a articulate, reasoned, logical, think it through, where did the problem come from? How do we get up? And all of that to them is so foreign. It's like, no, it's my way of the highway. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm unclear that logic is foreign, but that pro that's, it seems like logic is being rejected. I mean, if you ask them, if you ask them who to put in the lineup for the next game of their favorite baseball team, they'll give you stats, they'll give you logic. They, they can, I think, they can work that through. Um, if, you know, whatever it might be. I think, I think most humans are sort of there. We may be at a moment where the, the reason dancer is outweighed by the passion and the contempt you're talking about. And also that the contempt that you're hearing them express may be mirroring the contempt they feel from the blue States, the coasts, the, you know, whatever else it might be. This, this may actually be sort of a, a mutually reinforcing kind of situation where. And that's exactly, we, that's exactly what the person from the Dalai Lama's group was talking about. You, we've got to stop reflecting that back to them. Yeah. And, and so the Dalai Lama would come at this with compassion. He'd, he'd be like, right. thing to do here is to just absorb whatever anger is in, is in the room and let it be and right. just come at this with compassion in different ways. I'm struck also that um, John Gottman, I think, is the, or maybe it's Ekman, uh, one of those researchers is, is the ones who, who researches marriages. And the, the micro gesture that they look for when they look at five minutes of tape of a couple talking right. is, is contempt. Right, I, told, I, I got that connection immediately. He yeah. looks for that within 15 minutes of a conversation with the, the couple and he can tell they're gonna be divorced in five years. Exactly. And, and, and the, the, the emotion he, he senses is contempt or, or some, le some level of that kind of relationship. So at a societal level, we seem to be there, mm -hmm. right? Which, which means divorce at a societal level, which means revolution or, or uprising or tearing apart of a country or whatever. That, that's kind of where we are. <clears throat> But what's in between? I, I mean, other than being the Dalai Lama and, and expressing compa compassion, yeah, this sort of, in my mind, harkens back. You you had uh, last year, I think it was the Parker Palmer uh, mm -hmm. interview, and and he was talking about how long, and in, in some cases, two years of expressing the compassion before all of a sudden it 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 emerges. Mm -hmm. the, the, the reaction, the one example that he gave of the, of the woman that they were talking to was a teacher and she was always bashing the, the black students and always, you know, just totally. And then all of a sudden she got to know one of them and she was in tears. Yeah. Because well, all I, of a sudden now she understood their, their problem. A huge piece of this is familiarity. I mean, <clears throat> my favorite song on this topic is You've Got to Be Carefully Taught uh, from the musical South Pacific. And it's basically a song that says, we're not born biased, prejudiced or whatever. We were very carefully taught by the cultures into which we happen to be born by the birth lotto, mm -hmm. right? And so, so, so you're born into a culture that hates X people or, <clears throat> or, was, or was, you know, attempted genocide. You, you, there's still a few of you around, but some other culture actually tried to wipe you out or whatever it might be. <clears throat> or 
ancient grudges real or imagined. And um, I think, to my mind, familiarity is one of the few things that will overcome that. Um, and in some cases, blinded familiarity, meaning um, one of the reasons early on when there were full text adventure games online, MUDs and Moos and all that stuff, one of the reasons I loved them was that they were just text and you really couldn't tell who was sitting behind the other keyboard and you could make friends with somebody without realizing that had you seen them, you would have avoided them, right? That would disclose itself maybe later. And then you'd be like, oh, and they beat me in, in like Nintendo Wii or, or they, you know, they, they puzzled through this thing better than I was and maybe we can, maybe we can talk and have a relationship. So, I, so sometimes like the skinnier the, the communication method that can be helpful too, because it allows us to form relationships that we might not normally form. Hmm. Anybody else have, have an angle on, on, is it as bad as we're describing here? Like, like it, are, we, are we at the point of sort of national level contempt that's factionalizing us and, and tearing us? Well, uh, there's this lady that I met actually in Dubrovnik uh, 2016, Ev Evelyn Lindner. And she does something that she calls uh, humiliation studies. Uh, and actually, she's into dignity and humiliation studies. Um, and I thought this was kind of an interesting concept. I mean, it's, in a way, it's kind of the flip side of uh, contempt. Um, because, uh, you know, people feel humiliated when they feel um, the victims of maybe unconscious contempt, you know, of like unconscious privilege, for example. And, and then it works both ways because then you have contempt uh, flowing on both sides. Um, but that leads to a loss of human dignity, which is kind of the interesting thing. And, uh, so, and I think that's kind of interesting in terms of compassion um, needs a sharp edge and the sharpest edge needs to be pointed toward oneself uh, because that's really the only immediately effective change we can make is starting with ourselves and uh, and there's so much unconscious effect that's going on i mean for example you know looking at trump as a product of the american media essentially and he and he's correct you know he's you know quote unquote a genius at that you know, he was very popular. He knows how to pull those strings and so on. Uh, in, a, in a way, he's like, you know, Asimov's mule in the second foundation. You know, he's slightly mutant quality, but still very effective. And, but that, that media empire is something we have all created, actually. So, you know, I, I don't think he's a creation of his base, so to speak, but he's able to magnetize that base based on these kind of fixation, uh, the fixation economy ultimately that we have created. I mean, myself included, you know, I've been part of the, you know, the kind of work I do. So it's, uh, uh, you know, there's, 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 it's only our own bootstraps that are going to lift us up from that. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's my thought on that. Mr. May, do you want to jump in mule wise or otherwise? Yeah, unmuting there. Um, well, I, I actually, I have been saying that Trump is the mule for over a year, and Jerry knows this, um, mm -hmm. but from a slightly different, uh, coming that from a slightly different angle, I do future, you know, forecasting futurism work for a living. And if you remember from, from uh, foundations, uh, foundation stories, um, Harry Seldon was a psychohistorian, which was essentially a mathematical futurist. And what was, not, what was interesting about the mule was that he was not just outside the realm of what, what was considered plausible. He was outside the realm of what was considered possible. So it wasn't just a black swan. It wasn't just something that um, would, you know, we've never seen that, so it probably doesn't exist. It was something that we, have, we can firmly believe this is not, this is not possible. And if you look at Trump from the, from a political history perspective, we are simply, the way he has behaved and his effectiveness in this behavior was seen as simply not possible. That was not something that the system would allow. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think we have a, I don't think we have, have yet developed the means to adapt to this 
to the changes that he represents. And unfortunately, we don't have a hidden second foundation to come and rescue our asses. Um, you know, so basically, I was thinking, just thinking this morning about the, so let's say Trump has a heart attack. He eats too many, one too many Big Macs, has a heart attack and dies. Pence takes over. Um, what is stopping Pence or whomever follows him <laughs> from simply following the same footsteps of saying no to, to the established norms? Mm -hmm. but, but the, so that's, that's really interesting. I, ha I have no way of imagining Pence playing a role like Trump has played. I can't see him breaking the norms the way Trump did. But Trump, Trump seems, and, and in fact, almost everybody still is waiting for Trump to normalize. It's like, when will he stop being so crazy? When in fact, this is the MO that got him where he is. And he's gonna keep being Trump, right? Let Trump be Trump is sort of the, like the campaign motto inside. Um, so so I, I find that interesting because I'm not, and like, should Oprah run against him, which, you know, showed us, shows up on Sunday from the Golden Globes after her talk, her, her wonderful, like nine minutes on stage. Um, and I'm unclear that Oprah can break a norm the way Trump can break a norm. And I don't know whether that's what's necessary to defeat Trump. And we, I'm sorry, I've taken us into a, in a, into a corner of the argument, but, <clears throat> but, but whether what Trump is doing is playing a role to provoke the kind of contempt and sentiment that we just talked about because that lights people up on both ends and creates a division he can exploit. I think that's super interesting. And I, I, I'm not clear that Pence even understands that. Well, maybe Pence is not the right example. I should say okay. that follows. But the, the point is that Trump has demonstrated that um, the system, it does not, the system is not self-enforcing. Right. Well, that, that, so this is, this is our great, great weakness in the middle, is that the system at many different levels, and I'd love to explore this a little bit together, um, seems to not converge. It seems to, like, tear. Can, can I just throw in an idea, you know, that follows that? I've been, been trying to study this to try and understand the mechanics of the system. And there's a book out by David Halley called The 17 Contradictions of Capitalism and the End of Capitalism. And it's basically giving you exactly what you said. In other words, that, that the system is inherently dissociative. In other words, that the word that, that he uses a lot is alienation, universal alienation. And I've been reading psychological you know, work that, that dovetails with that. In other words, a lot of what we've done in terms of child raising and everything, trying to make it more mechanical, trying to make it more, you know, routinized with respect to mechanization of the educational system, and etc., is all sort of splitting us apart because it's making us focus on our individual needs and our individual perspectives and our individual perception of what's right and wrong. And we become very almost supported in being individually oriented and if the result of that the way that <clears throat> that the uh, the book does and i put together a summary by the way if anybody wants to see it, I, can, I can post it i don't know how to post on this particular program but um in essence it, it would make it easier to go through the 17 different contradictions and and some of them are very simple things like freedom and domination you can't have freedom too unless you're dominating somebody else and that's in essence what the, the sort of dialogue of the neoliberalism is, is that I need to have unlimited freedom so that I can go to, into your, your country and steal everything and you, you don't have any right to stop me. You know, so in, in, in a sense, it's inherent in the system. Now, what I'm getting at though, in other words, what we're looking at as a possible solution is cryptocurrencies. If you follow the logic, in other words, what's driving that, it's lack of trust in the system. Mm -hmm. And the whole point of blockchain and this new program called Hashgraph <clears throat> is to be able to create a layer of trust in the system. Now, we're actually working with some people who understand more of the mechanics and how you do this to try and create a currency which could be developed for low-income neighborhoods in order to establish an economy that is not controlled by the banks and not controlled by big business and not controlled by sort of the normal systems that, that, in, that in essence enable the domination of the system. And so in that sense, they could start 
and we would seed it. We're actually starting to, to work with Grameen Bank America. They've, they've just recently, within the last month, opened their, their first office in Miami. And they're, they're, I think we're the 14th office in the United States. So the idea would be to integrate their microloans with the potential of a cryptocurrency that would support a trust level that they could rely on and that could organize for their benefit, not for the benefit of somebody else, because it's all decentralized. And so they could actually start to develop their own, their own system of economic viability, sustainability, and, and value orientation. They're not accepting somebody else's value. The focus of this is trust. In my mind, going back to the contempt issue, in other words, how do you resolve that compassion, this, that, and the other thing? Ultimately, whatever it is that you come up with as a systemic solution has to have embedded in it trust. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, the more decentralized you, you have a trust-based system, the more likelihood you're willing to, to step into it and try and see if you can trust and you can be trusted. And so in that concept, you know, you come up with a structural solution, not just a conversational solution. Just one point of clarification um, from the blockchain folks that I know, they would uh, take, take exception to the idea that the blockchain um, embeds trust. They actually would argue that blockchain does, is a trustless system. There's no trust required for blockchain to function for Bitcoin to other kinds of cryptocurrencies, that it do, you no longer have to even think about trust because the system is self-enforcing. Oh, right. it's, that, it's similar, but I think it's, it's an important conceptual difference. It, it's important conceptual difference, but in essence, if you were to sort of listen to the interviews of Lehman Baird, the, the sort of founder of the Hashgraph part or the supporter of it, and he actually calls his company Swirls, which is a combination of shared worlds where in essence, it's that combination of yes, there's trust built into the system, but the shared world aspect being that I choose to be in this because I don't have to focus on it because it's inherent in the system. Mm -hmm. So I totally hear what, and he goes through the list, you know, in terms of what's priority. And he unfortunately lists fairness as the number three item. Security obviously is number one. Um, but, but all I'm getting at is that I totally agree with you that it's, it's not inherent necessarily, but if you build it in and then invite people to work within that world, then you've got the ability to, to rely on it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So just, um, uh, a side note on blockchain and so forth. Uh, everybody's trusting that these algorithms work, that the servers aren't concentrated, et cetera, et cetera. And last I checked until the Chinese government said, oops, we're all going to get out of this Bitcoin thing, stop the mining. All of the mines that were, were actually functioning were in China, getting cheap energy and et cetera, et cetera. Like they were all, they didn't have locks on the doors. The, the PLA could walk in at any moment and, you know, go ahead and take over, all that kind of stuff. So it's like, there's this blind trust in, in an infrastructure that to me doesn't seem like it was, you know, um, very trustworthy. Uh, and everybody's like, oh, this is working great. Let's go. Okay. But that's where, if you listen to Lehman Baird stuff, that's exactly what he criticizes. He, he, he says that it's not inherent in blockchain. Mm -hmm. Saw a great headline on the Washington post. I'm looking for the URL right now. That was, uh, Bitcoin is teaching libertarians the laws of economics. That's cute. Just the idea that economics has a law would be fun. So who, if anybody, is approaching this in a useful, creative way? Bill, you're you're diving in. You're looking for communities and trying to figure out how to how to bridge these boundaries. Um, who who else is tackling this in ways that are that are high function? And by this, I don't mean blockchain. By this, I mean this sort of bitter divide we've been talking about. 
um, how do we reach out to the other? How do we, um, how do we actually start to start this, these conversations that might cause some healing? Nobody seen anything? April, what do you? <clears throat> You're muted. Um, sorry, I was hearing somebody. I heard a voice in the background. I thought someone else was speaking. I think it's just somebody in the background in one of our. Yeah, I said what? But that was very funny because I was like, yep. "Can they speak up?" <laughs> no, nothing to add at this point. I'm I'm just very much in listening mode at the moment. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, other than what I posted in the, in the chat, I, I feel this is a classic case in which, sure, I could spout off about some opinion. I, I actually have much more to learn and listen right now. So keep going. Hi, Dave. Hey. Yeah, well, well, one thing um, I, I, um, I might want to mention is Otto Scheimer and the Presencing Institute and the Theory U Tribe and his recent or soon to start uh, cooperation with HuffPost, where he's, he is trying to uh, improve the conversation. Uh, so, uh, um, I don't have the URL right off the top, but, uh, actually I'll, I'll dig it up and put it in, in the chat. And, uh, you know, he, 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 he and, uh, the, that group has a pretty sophisticated theory, but also <laughs> praxis. And, uh, and I think both theory and praxis can be obstacles. Um, but they can also be enablers if you're not pushing, if you're, you know, not pushing your religion, but you're pushing your relationship instead, which, you know, hopefully is enabled by your practice. Um, so th that's one of the best I've been able to, to, to come across. Uh, um, in fact, we had uh, Otto as a, as a guest of ours. Uh, Todd brought him in as a, as a guest on a Rex call. So we've, we've had some exposure to him. Also, Raj Sisodia. Uh, through conscious capitalism, uh, things like that. So um, there's some really interesting practitioners out there who at this moment seem like are on the fringe, right? They're not in the center of any conversation that's happening as politics basically spack spackles the wall with, uh, with body parts. So let me throw in the the other kind of gorilla in the room, which is the role of social media in all this. And um, what Facebook wasn't aware of and have they woken up? Uh, is this fixable? I posted a couple of articles uh, in the invite about, uh, hey, their business, their fundamental business model is flawed. There's no way to back, back out of that. So their job is, is to sell our attention. They can never, you know, they can never fix that spiral. Uh, Anybody um, have strong feelings about this, about whether Facebook is as guilty as it seems to be they're being charged and whether or not it's fixable from their perspective? Let, let me enter and, you know, sort of interject a, uh, an aspect that's an answer to that. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're embarking on a program with illegal women voters in Florida to try and make sure that a lot of millennials get into the political process and, and be prepared to, to vote in the 2018 election. And to me, it's gonna be an experiment that started with the, you know my sort of looking at the website for League of Women Voters and sort of noticing it was really clunky and it didn't look millennial to me. And when I started talking to some of the millennials in our office about how we could improve that, et cetera, they looked at me like, oh, nobody looks at websites and things like that anymore. It's all social media, you know? And so I've got to re-envision the idea of how you do that kind of engagement because it's beginning to be more, not even Facebook. They don't even, they can, obviously they don't necessarily trust Facebook. That, that's too rigid. They're, you know, they've got their other systems, none of which I'm really involved in at this point. But, but the, the answer is you've got to go to the where, where they are and, and talk in, in that way and, and don't assume that they don't know that those other places like Facebook are, are rigged and that they don't want to be there either. 
how much do people not want to be on which platform? I mean, it, it's very, it's really interesting because Facebook now has more active monthly users than there are humans in China. <clears throat> so it's, Facebook is the largest country on earth. So somebody's in there doing a lot of things every day. Um, and we're learning more and more that it's very spinnable. Um, it's funny, many years ago, I did some work with Target uh, and Target's online presence was hosted by Amazon. And at the time already, Amazon was famous for micro-marketing and for really knowing how to tweak what they were sending to everybody and all that. But it turns out that Target, which you would think would have been a major, major, major client, had a complete junior varsity version of the Amazon platform. It was basically like a store window. They could put products in. They, they could not do any micro-targeting, micro micro-anything. They were given nothing. And here it looks like Facebook has exposed to any amateur posing as anything, a really sophisticated engine that lets you slice and dice and target for not a lot of money, messages you've invented and pasted with the CNN logo or the RT logo or the whatever you want to logo. You know, you can invent kind of a, a video, drop it in, and the vetting behind who and what and where did this come from is negligible, but the power accessible is, is remarkable. I mean, it, it, it seems like it's at the opposite end of the spectrum from what Amazon was offering Target back in the day. And, and is this what you, what you all are seeing? Well, I think the way I see it is, I mean, for example, well, personally, uh, I am, I'm on Facebook, and mainly because some of my friends and family are. And although I found that more and more the experience is like sh shattered mirror shards, um, and there's, there's no sense of history. Um, it's, uh, and, and therefore I can understand the studies which show that the more you use Facebook, the more your personal and social uh, bonds break down, the more unhappy you are. Um, I use Twitter, I originally started using it because, hey, if someone has, is a good thinker uh, and is worth following, I wanna follow that person. And, but on the other hand, it's become kind of a popularity contest also. But I think behind both of those, the core is, in two words, uh, fixation monetization. Mm -hmm. So it's basically taking the attention economy and realizing, oh, the more I can get people to look at stuff, uh, the more I can monetize that. And therefore, like on zillions of web pages, at the bottom, you'll see all these cheesy little squares, you know, with, you know, click this and you'll see the 17s or, you know, this celebrity, blah, blah. And same thing on Facebook, there's more and more of this kind of stuff. So ultimately I think it goes that it's economics driven. Um, so it's kind of like Naomi Klein's uh, book on climate change where she says this changes everything. And that you know, behind all that is the fact that, hey, this is being driven by capitalism or it's, it's being driven by unlimited Ponzi scheme growth basically. And until you address that, you're not really gonna address anything. So I think that's the bottom line. And the economic growth has now been unleashed sort of more than ever before. I mean, the, the, the current tax cut and other sorts of policies, the rolling back of regulations everywhere uh, have, have provoked the Dow and the NASDAQ to new records. All, you know, all kinds of crazy things are happening separate from Bitcoin's crazy uh, run up in, at the end of last year as well. Tom, what, what, how are you interpreting these things as, as macro forces now? What, how does this fit the narratives that, that, you're using yeah it's um there's certain social currents in the united states that i think really need to be uh, examined as the background to this and so i've been going back and rereading books like bowling alone by robert putnam nickel and dimed um, charles murray had a book called coming apart but this idea of the social fabric of america declining and a Concurrent with that, there's a couple of other things going on. Primarily, it's the economic divide that we have. The rich are getting richer, the concentration of wealth. And so you have different groups of people that are all experiencing a lot of different tensions. And they're all, they, they feel frustrated, they feel angry, but how are they venting that or experiencing that or who do they see as accountable for that? And that's where you get these sort of uh, different tribes of people trying to explain what the world is like. Mm -hmm. White Working Class is a book by Joan Williams, and she talks about you have the elites, and the elites are in the red camp and the blue camp, but right below them, you've got this massive working class of people 
and below them, you've got the very poor and a lot of black Americans are in that very poor area. And they, uh, the animosity between those two groups, the white working class and these, these um, welfare queens that Ronald Reagan invented that epitomize the poor who take from the system because these up at the top, all these elite liberals are giving them stuff that they don't deserve, um, that they are not earning. And so there, there's this tension between these large groups, but everybody is stressed at this point. This is a, an economy with most of the people feeling a lot of tension. Average wages haven't gone up for most people since the 70s or 80s. And so I'm trying to figure out wh what are the different groupings here? Um, early in the, in the um, chat, I posted an article like how half of, like, half of America lost its fucking mind. It was an article in, of all places, Cracked Magazine. Mm -hmm. But it really did a good job of it kind of explaining the tensions between different groups. Uh, if you look at Angus Deaton's um, Nobel Prize recently, what was he studying? He was studying how are people coping with the, these pressures? You know, they're turning to meth, they're turning to other drugs, they're turning to self-inflicted gunshot wounds and suicides and alcohol. Americans are killing themselves at a faster rate now that our actual life expectancy is going down compared to every, which is not happening in any other developed world. So I'm trying to see these social tensions. And then at the same time, you have some really sophisticated people who have learned that these new social media can help them get their message out in a very targeted way. So I'm assuming everybody's very familiar with Cambridge Analytica and you talk about micro-targeting. They, they brag about having 4,000 different data points for every American. Um, but they also know the psychology of messaging and how they can help reinforce this echo chamber effect. If you, and at the same time, you've got those behind the scenes. If any of you have read uh, Jane Meyer's uh, Dark Money, for example, what are the Mercers and the Cokes and everybody doing? They're investing a lot of money in social engineering. Uh, it's, they started off years ago developing their institutes, the think tanks that, that um, develop the ideas that get put into the legislation. And these ideas then help concentrate the wealth in the very wealthy. And you just saw it with the la latest tax bill. It's going to exacerbate, exacerbate this problem. So how do we help people see that it's a systemic issue, that there are rules to capitalism that we can, we can address, that we need to look at both the regulations and the taxation side of it, not just what I consider what Raj is doing. And by the way, I'm helping develop the Atlanta chapter of conscious capitalism. Cool. But I, I don't see that as a good fix. I see that as individual actors within the system doing what they can without changing the system. And companies like the one I used to work with at Coca-Cola, they're much better at managing the system. All right, they, it's their lobbyists that really do a lot of the, the hard work of making sure that we get the tax breaks we want, that all of you are paying um, subsidizing all the Coca-Cola products through your taxes that subsidize, for example, the growing of corn or the reform, refining of corn into high fructose corn syrup. Right. So it's, it's, it's that economic structure that we need to look at. I, I think there are some people who are talking about the right fixes, but then there's a completely different conversation of how does it feel to exist within that system? And that true anger that these people have that voted for Trump um, is very, very real, but what, it's, it's very difficult to ascribe your suffering to something as uh, abstract as an economic policies. Mm -hmm. um, well, we it's, it's, al it's also interesting when Anand talks about how he was pretty convinced that his shiny, globalized, all linked together world was going to be good for everybody. Like, you know, I, I, he was preaching, preaching the gospel of globalization, let's say, um, thinking that all ships would rise in it and not he, seeing or hearing which ships were actually sinking in the middle of the whole thing. So it's interesting. It's, it's, it's partly about where is our attention drawn? What are we able to pay attention to? Um, uh, a piece of it is about listening. And I love how he talks about, you know, I heard you, but I wasn't listening. Um, I, I, you know, I actually didn't listen. You know, this idea that Trump's a master communicator, and he, and he really is, um, is a smaller example. A bigger example is in the book, um, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, um, which details how 
Putin really understood this emerging world very well and very early. And his, mass, his ability to control television statements and the messages that get out there. Um, the, the idea that you keep people confused and divided and distrustful of any authority or institution and to the point where if nobody can agree on what truth is, those who currently have the power are going to be able to benefit in that situation. Nobody's going to be able to get the power, wrest the power from them because there's going to be too much confusion and distrust and uh, atomization of all enemies. And we've talked here, um, I, I talked about the documentary hypernormalization and this idea about nonlinear warfare where it's much cheaper to win an information war or a propaganda war than it is to drop bombs and, you know, shoot bullets. <clears throat> so so all, all of this, like the Pomerantsev stuff is really, really lovely evidence for how that's already underway. We're, we're, we're hip deep in, in a nonlinear war as we speak. We just sort of aren't reacting to it as if that were happening. And then the problem with using a war metaphor and, and here all, you know, the war on drugs and the war on terror and a bunch of other things that have been kind of stupid ideas is that it gets you into either a defensive footing or a freak out. And that's probably not the right answer either. Like the, the, the you know, the <laughs> antidote to nonlinear warfare is not nonlinear counterinsurgency. You know, there's uh, an aspect to this. And if anybody listening knows, somebody had uh, a thought that goes something like this, which is um, nationalism is a great idea because it keeps people focused away from class divisions. And we're seeing a rise in nationalism right now, which really serves the, those who have power right now, simply because we are not self-organizing on class basis at this point. Um, we have this left versus right idea and not this lower class or wealthy versus unwealthy distinction. Um, keeping nationalism and xenophobia alive helps us, prevents us from other organizational schemes that would actually give us more power relative to those who have institutionalized um, governmental economic power right now. Mm -hmm. Also, when you, when we sort of started talking earlier about these narratives that are, that are dominating the, the political sphere, um, in some cases, the swing to the far right away from logic and, and reason is the only way those parties are going to stay in power. And, it, and what they're doing is incredibly powerful because we're not really very connected. The social fabric is shredded. We're not very connected in the community. We're not exactly sure whom to trust. We're now bathed in a medium, a wash in a medium that lets messages travel very, very quickly and get moved around and amplified. Um, so we, our defense mechanisms for how to look around and whom to trust and what to think about are, are, are broken. They're really, they're really down. Um, so we're at, a, we're at a very vulnerable moment in the middle of all this, I think. But we've, we've, we've created superconductivity for ideas and opinions We've cut away our history. We don't remember stuff. We've not taken the time to weave back together the kinds of, I mean, we have a small group here that has some trust built. Uh, each of us is in a variety of different communities and networks where there's trust built. But those are wee little things and none of them is reaching out hard to try to bridge to other networks to try to figure out how does this work you know, with, with more and more people. Is anyone familiar with the work that Joe Brewer is doing? Um, because this idea that the Cambridge Analytica evil people are doing this culture crafting, which they're doing quite well, but who is also on the, the side of good honing those same skills? Uh, do you mean specifically the skills of how of sort of combat in the public arena, verbal combat, or do you mean other skills? Because uh, <clears throat> Dave is hip deep in the regenerative economy, which is doing all kinds of positive stuff and is not, <clears throat> is not about the deficit side or the problem side, mm -hmm. but is rather about thinking about how do we actually regenerate, you know, things, including the, the ideas of capitalism. So w w which part of this do you mean, Tom? Uh, it seems that there's, there are certain rules that are being applied right now in terms of keeping people confused and, and separated. And you can control the, uh, the dialogue that's going on out there, all of which isn't really building toward anything, but is, seems to be used to keep things um, 
chaotic enough so that nobody can truly uh, rally up against you. There's no there there to push against. As soon as you push against any one truth or person, it kind of dissipates and or it gets diverted to the next new thing. Um, and you never know who to trust. And so if somebody says something bad about me and you all want to gang up on me, it's like, well, who do you really believe? Because I'll find 10 other people who are going to say something good. Right. Uh, I, that's the situation we're in. And so how do we exist in a cooperative, effective way, pro, productive way in that environment versus just keeping the system um, chaotic enough to allow the status quo to stay? Well, and often one slice of the population is played off against another. So um, you would think that there'd be kind of class warfare uh, in, you know, during Reconstruction and other eras where the poor whites would get together with the emancipated blacks and they would like say, hey, great, let's, let's make sure that workers, that people who normally don't get much, have more. And in fact, what happens is um, the wealthy whites co-op the poor whites by saying, hey, you're going to get privilege you're going to get respect on the street. You're going to get all these social cues of inclusion and respect that blacks will never get. So you're with us, not with them. And, and that works. It works beautifully, actually. Um, so, so I'm looking at the narratives today about who's trying to drive whom closer to whom or further away from whom. How does this all, how does this all play out? I mean, and, and in nonlinear warfare, partly what, what you want is just the fog of war so that you don't know whom to trust anyway and you kind of give up, which is, which is different as well. Well, I think one aspect of this is that um, there's a well-funded techie infrastructure that creates supposedly value-neutral tools, which then became available to those who most want to take advantage of those tools. And there's no kind of organic feedback in terms of the human ecosystem. I mean, Facebook is conducting a live experiment on 2 billion people as we speak. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, which apparently seems to be having significant effects, you know, both individually and socially. So uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I don't know what to do with, with that, but that seems to be part of it. Uh, and maybe that's the notion of, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're all, there's a lot of smart nerds creating fantastic stuff, and that's good. That's fantastic. And we'll make money on it, too. <laughs> and, uh, but then there are consequences, and it's really hard to anticipate. And highly motivated people who scratched their heads for a while and figured out what was at hand, what was available, and had little to lose, dove in and used the medium very, very powerfully um, to foster their own ends. And they did a great job of it. Yeah, and, and it's it's works both ways because you know like Obama succeeded because his people made use of those tools very well even though they were much more primitive at the time. Right now they're much more sophisticated. You know, what, what did you say? Four thousand data points on every person. I mean, that's mm -hmm. staggering. You know, well, and, and, and one of the big missed opportunities was when my Barack Obama was dropped as soon as Obama became president for a variety of reasons, and nobody picked it up and started using it as a way of knitting society together and taking care of problems and, and rethinking how local politics and how local governance actually happens. Because there was a monster opportunity to do that and that was just left on the ground. And I think a, a, a big reason why that goes away over the eight years of Obama's administration is that nobody actually did anything with it. Has anyone read Mark Lilla's book, The Once and Future Liberal? Basically, not. time for liberals are too caught up in identity politics. And unfortunately, that feeds into this problem that we're talking about here because it causes us to identify subsets of liberals. So you have women here, black here, poor here, you know, trans over there. And it gives a, and it keeps us from aggregating our power and it allows everybody to have somebody to hate on the other side. Um, I haven't read the book. I've got it sitting in front of me, but I. If anyone has a, an assessment, I'd love to hear it. Um, I've not heard of it, and I'm, I'm looking it up now. Um, to me, this is fascinating because one of the things that happened before the election cycle or during the election cycle was Black Lives Matter, a whole series of what we would call identity politics things, ha you know, moments happening. And now we have Me Too and Time's Up and, and so on and so forth. Um, 
And from my perspective, it's like, well, about damn time, you know, people who've been wronged severely through, throughout time might actually be able to enter the arena as equals if we can sort some of these issues out. And every time that gets anywhere near maybe being effective, it gets beaten back by things like an assault on identity politics. This is going to, this is divisive. You're, you know, uh, you're, you're, this is going to tear society apart. Can we act together? And so I, I'm curious what everybody feels about this issue. Cause I'm, I'm totally on the side of let's actually respect everybody and let's honor the fact that some people um, have suffered a lot uh, through history and figure out how to work with that. But, but, <clears throat> often that means that the people who inflicted the pain are going to have to cop to some responsibility for it, even if it's generationally a couple of generations behind them. It's really tough. A April, what's your, uh, what's your general feeling on, on, on that issue? You're still muted. There. There, I'm unmuted. Yeah. Um, I know. So I don't, I don't know. I, I really struggle with this because I think I agree with everything that you're saying here, but, um, well, to play devil's, not even devil's advocate, the generational blame thing, I think it's really tricky really fast. Um, if you were not alive when really bad shit happened and yet you're somehow responsible for it. That just bodes well, I mean, that bodes poorly from the get go, particularly Jerry, from your perspective that human beings are born good. So now we're in a situation where you're born good, but you're socialized into a place that's less good. Or, I mean, I'm being totally opinionated here, but you know, fill in the blank with whatever you'd like. And, we're actually, is there a layer that you're not actually born into the world good because you have all of this generational baggage? I, so I, that, I, I mean, <clears throat> I, I guess where I'm with you, I'm just really, really struggling from the perspective. I almost feel like, okay, so where do we put the shovel in the ground? Like figuratively, mm -hmm. where do you put the shovel in the ground to start digging, to start working, to start going on this? because what there is to unpack and here I'm just going to talk about yeah I, I there's so many different threads we could talk about here you know is it gender is it minority status is it whatever but let's just say you know the privileged white male class um middle to upper class that's going to be asking every piece of that cohort I do want to ask every piece of that cohort to give up a little something level and level things out just a little bit i'm i'm at a total loss for what that first you know stake in the ground looks like well i shouldn't say at a total loss i'm at a total loss for what actually might stick what actually might work and lead to something instructive as opposed to more pushback resistance you know or pulling the veil over other people's eyes sorry I, you were going to say something no, not at all. Let me just um, reflect a little bit on what you just said. And I think it's very, I think from my perspective, it's really easy to stay with the position that people are born good. And I think the request is, and I'm probably oversimplifying this, but the request is to people of privilege, and that generally means white men, um, to pay attention to the privilege, to be aware of it, and then to adjust for it in whatever way they know how. And to adjust for it means Maybe to shut up when in a group and not trample over other people's conversations. Maybe to notice uh, or to not blame someone else for their opinion that's different from yours, but rather to listen to it with a different set of ears given history. Or maybe to, uh, you know, there's lots of different ways in which this could play out. And I think the request is, and maybe the simplest way to say it is, you know, a deep listening and loving speech on the part of people of privilege. And if, if, if that happened a whole lot more, we'd have a lot fewer of the rest of these problems. I is, that, that, is that just too simple? Sorry, go ahead. I, I, I think that it might, nest, might need to be a little bit simpler. In, in okay, good. One of, the, one of the books that I think I've referred to in the past is uh, Mark Bly's Great Transformations. Mm -hmm. 
And in it, he, he, he does a good job of explaining two great transformations, essentially, over the last hundred years. One was the New Deal era, and the second was basically the takeover of that. In other words, dissing Keynesian economics and bringing in neoliberalism as the solution, in other words, free markets. And his point, really, in structuring the book, is, The Great Transformations, is to say that we're dealing clearly in a very complex environment. And our problem arises when we don't understand why something happened. And in essence, what the New Deal did for the economy back then was explain it on the lack of institutions to support certain guiding principles. And at that time, the guiding principles were focused on aggregate demand. In other words, what can we do for Social Security? What can we do for workers? What can, and, and to an extent, that happened almost by accident because of the fact that, that FDR apparently started out trying to work in a, in, in, with the, the powers that be at the supply side and couldn't get them to cooperate. In mm -hmm. essence, they, they thought they already had control. Why did they need to do anything? And so he literally was going out and teaching farmers and everything, which was 70% of our economy at that time, how to organize and how to articulate their needs. And so they started building institutions. Now, the whole point that Mark Bly gets at it is that structurally, if you're in a com complex environment, you really don't know what the solution is. You don't even know what the cause is. And so you have to postulate a simple perception of what the cause was with a structural ideation, as he calls it, of what the solution would be, and then try it. And the more the institutions, in a way, rigidly conform to that, in other words, try it out and see whether or not it works, it obviously creates a certain amount of resistance in the system, which ultimately is going to crack and they're going to come up with a different explanation. What was the neoliberal, oh, your Keynesian economics couldn't explain stagflation, and therefore I'm going to bring in my neoliberalism, and free markets are going to establish all this wonderfulness, and, and we're going to be saved. Which, again, is this oversimplification, but they get the institutions, the Federal Reserve, and everybody to adopt this simplification, and they diss anybody that argues with it, because in their mind, we've got to test this before we can call it right or wrong that it, it did or didn't work. And so all I'm saying is we're, we're now searching for people who, who understand this. We're searching for a new simplification that would enable us to start to build. And, and to me, this is the whole point of the cryptocurrencies. They're a structural way to avoid being trapped by the existing elites, which just as an aside, there was a wonderful analysis that was done about how failures in society ultimately come from the competing elites. Neither one of them wants to let go of their perception that they're right. And so they end up consuming more and more of the, of the social resources, com, com, you know, competing with everybody else because they, they, they really don't care about the hoi ploy, the, the little guys. They just care about themselves and they don't want to let go of them being right. And so in that context, you need a decentralized system that has a certain level of constructed trust where you can trust in your own environment, in your own town, your own city, your own, your own work, whatever. So to, to my thinking, that's the transformation that's structurally, in other words, it needs to be institutional, not necessarily institutional like in, in the FDA or you know, the Federal Reserve, but more in the sense of some kind of a structure that you can trust. And then you start to articulate, articulate what does that trust need? If you don't like this group's trust structure, try another one. And hence different sort of currency regimes, different currency platforms that are emerging that might actually have those kinds of flavors to them where people would right. shop for a regime they, they like on, atop a, a coin and a currency system that they like. Right. Um, in terms of the over, sort of dramatically simple messages, I'm like so shocked that trickle down economics is back. Like I thought that was one of those vampires with like 10 stakes in its heart. I thought plenty of, you know, economists had, had done a good job debunking it. And yet, you know, wham, here it comes, uh, rammed through at the end of the year and uh, trickle down is back, right? It, um, it, yeah. it, it's one of those crazy things. 
Yeah, but, but it's in not, this case, it's more it's more just a, a cover for, for kleptocracy. Perfect, right. perfect statement. Co cover is exactly what it is. It's bullshit, and they know it's bullshit, but they get, get away with it. Well, they had to pass something, and it had to smell like big tax cuts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know? Well, and they, 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 they do want to get rid of government. So their, their <laughs> motivation, the fact that they end up with a whole bunch of money probably doesn't hurt. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm really curious about the the um, the the identity politics stuff, Tom, and I I haven't figured it out. I mean, I mean, we it's it, it, one is like I guess I'm mostly hearing old white dudes complain about it, which makes me a little suspicious. Um, <clears throat> and and two, it's like, well, yeah, that's kind of what politics is, right? I mean, it's like you're representing your own interests, and I don't know if you if you look very closely at any of the Boston Globe coverage of race race in Boston, you know, where like the, the average uh, wealth of black Bostonians is $8. Um, you know, it's, it's these, the, it turns out that identity and actual status are pretty tightly tied. Mm -hmm. So I can't quite see how we could do politics without an identity component. So I don't understand kind of what the critique is about. I don't, so I, I hear people talk about it, how it's bad, but I don't quite understand what like the the option is like, you know, I'm supposed to ignore my identity. I don't, I don't know where that leads me. So, so I don't, I don't get it. And there's enough people stuck in identity. I don't even know what to call it. Dead ends where whatever prejudice had happened, whatever bias has happened is, is still alive. And you know, but the, the evidence you just cited about the net worth of black um, citizens of Boston is that kind of thing. It's like, and there's, there's 50 things that happened between redlining and job discrimination and who knows what that probably led to that. Um, and untangling that is, you know, policymakers worst nightmare and uh, job guarantee. Uh, and yet I, it seems like, except for maybe things like uh, alternate economic systems in the cryptocurrency world, which I don't see addressing these issues yet much, which is a really interesting question for me because I'm involved in a project that should be doing exactly that. So I'd like to take the conversation deeper into those waters uh, of how might these alternative regimes work. But otherwise, other than that, I see that we're like, it feels like we're at ground zero, right? It, it feels like what, what have we exactly learned over the last couple centuries about how this stuff is supposed to work? Okay, but Jerry, to an extent, looking at it, you know, with the, the, filter of you know the self-determination theory in other words we're supposed to go toward autonomy uh belongingness and competence it, it fits because of the fact that the identity politics is getting more and more granular in other words more and more responsibility for understanding your limits in other words the problem that you've only got eight dollars in boston etc in other words we we've relied to an extent too much on government and and institutions to solve our problems for us and we need to sort of bring them home in other words the, the old adage all politics is local and structure things in such a way that are more in our control not in their control and my point there, that's why we're going toward cryptocurrencies, because of the fact that, in essence, it's a way, not just for the currency, but to, sh to create that shared world where there is, an, is, is an, an appreciation for the fact that you need more income. You need less expenses. Let, let's try and sort of meet those at your door, not in some big, you know, thing that, that the state of Florida or the federal government passes, but that we construct it for you in your neighborhood with you deciding what the, the criteria are. Um, so the, the, the relationship economy narrative that fits nicely what you were just saying, Bill, is that um, we've been treated as mere consumers and we've consumerized every sector of human society, which removed our sense of agency and responsibility and as consumers, we were supposed to be good factory workers and good buyers of stuff. We weren't supposed to be citizens anymore. In fact, there's an active shift of talking about us as citizens to talking about us as, mere, as consumers. And that's a very big mental shift for policymakers. So we end up offloading, outsourcing, giving up our own engagement and responsibility to institutions and big government, et cetera, et cetera, which are then 
justifiably the targets of our rancor right now. It's like, you know, these institutions are too big and they're doing too much. We need less government. Totally agree. But in the meantime, we shredded our ability and even incentive to collaborate to fix these things together. And yet around the world, there are many groups that are trying to do that, like the Podemos people in, in Spain. And there's just hundreds and hundreds of groups like this that are uh, trying to take back agency, authority, uh, responsibility, and figure new ways to solve these problems. Exactly. Now, now, those do and don't overlap with the cryptocurrency realm. And, and, and I think less than more, which is what's interesting, because I'm sitting here trying to reflect, okay, I've been tracking those movements for a long time. I'm fascinated by them. I'm interested. How might they use these new crypto platforms to implement some of these other ways of, of governing together? And then I'll add a thought, which is the piece about cryptocurrencies I find most fascinating is that they are programmable. That, you know, uh, uh, Ethereum more than, Hi, than I'm Jada Yuan. I Bitcoin. Live in Brooklyn, but right Oops. now I'm in Los Angeles. Somebody's phone, sorry. Um, that the cryptocurrencies are programmable, which means that we can actually embed policy in the crypto ecosystems, which is super interesting. So I could invent a crypto coin that is only spendable within the Miami radius, right? right. It's, it's, it's geofenced. I could invent a coin that is a demerge currency. It loses 10% of value every month that you don't spend it to force everybody to spend it and keep it in circulation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's super duper interesting and could be a policy um, uh, lever I'm not hearing a lot of people play with that. We're working on it. Oh, excellent. We'll, we'll speed it up. <laughs> we literally had a meeting yesterday with, with a person. We're doing Bitcoin mining in our office simply so we can learn it. And we're going to start doing Litecoin mining. And the guy is going to start to artic, you know, organize how could we develop our own currency that has exactly, we were describe, describe, describing all the demurge part, in other words, the, the fact that you're trying to sort of increase circulation, not hoarding, which unfortunately Bitcoin is all hoarding at this point. Well, so, well you'd, be stupid, you'd be stupid to buy your pot with a, with a Bitcoin today if it's going to be worth twice as much tomorrow. You know what blew us away, though? When we, I heard for the first time ever, ever yes, yes. there are Bitcoin ATMs. Mm -hmm. And in Miami, where is the bulk of them? In Liberty City. I which, mean, no, which means what? I, Liberty City is? Liberty City is the lowest income area in the city of Miami. Wow. They have, they have an average income of, of around $11,000 a year. I have no idea why they're there. But you know, the, the first Bitcoin I got was at a bar called Dirty Nellie's in Halifax. They had an ATM, Bitcoin ATM there. I had never even heard of it before yesterday. But I, I just feel comfortable that, that low-income areas are beginning to, to acculturate to this and lowers finding ways to use it that we haven't even thought of yet. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, where's the leading edge of innovation on that front? Um, who, who besides you is out there figuring out, hey, how do, we, how do we leverage the programmability of these environments and the distributed trust and the visibility or, or semi-transparency of the system to design new kinds of policy interventions, uh, new sorts of ecosystem dynamics, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think these efforts will be bedeviled by the fact that the successful and visible cryptocurrencies are the ones that our people are looking at to appreciate like crazy, which means they're not going to transact with them. They're going to buy and hold them, which is the opposite of what you want for there to be right. a, a healthy sort of ecosystem, right? Well, you got to build that in. And, right. and to an extent, I mean, part of what drove me to this, this concept is that uh, one of the, I guess it was the first retailer that that's accepted Bitcoin, uh, Overstock.com, Patrick, um, I'm forgetting his last name, but the, the founder of that has a venture capital group, Medici Ventures, that has actually stated in one public, I haven't found the specifics yet, but that mm -hmm. they are willing to fund nonprofits. Patrick Byrne. Uh, Byrne, okay. They're willing to fund nonprofit organizations to increase the pro proliferation of uses of cryptocurrencies in the low income areas. Now, all I'm trying to get at is that, that they're at least seeing that there is a potential 
for the distribution that is related to income development, income generation, you know, assisting in, in social impact and stuff like that. But the, 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 definitely the, the guy who found it or is the primary lead of this hash graph, uh, Lehman Baird, is uh, his, his company Swirls, clearly wants to have shared worlds. In other words, where you're choosing to have a fair environment, to have criteria, values criteria that are, that are inherent in your world, your system. So he's wanting to do that. When you list, you know, listen to him list the, the priorities of the institutions he's working with, though, that's kind of way down the list. Their primary driver is security. Mm -hmm. um, if you have any other articles or, or things on, on Baird and Swirls, that would be really interesting if you can put them on the, on the Rex list or something. The, like that. the best thing is for that is to just go to YouTube. Oh, okay. In other words, they've got very good long interviews with him, and he's, he loves to talk. So he really gets into both how, how Hashgraph works and why. Sweet, thank you. Um, anything else about listening? About um, I'm, I'm a believer that we're, we're in the middle of an epidemic of not listening. That, that listening is one of the things that broke. Uh, and there are many people trying to do more listening. And one of the things I loved about uh, Anand's talk was that he said, look, I, I heard you, but I wasn't listening. Um, and one of the things that I think is asked of people of privilege is to listen better, to listen without taking offense, to listen, you know, in, in the whole, uh, if you look up how to be a good ally and, uh, and you, you're trying to figure out what to do, uh, one of the crib notes to people of privilege is, hey, you're not always the problem, so don't take it personally. And then another one of the crib notes is, hey, sometimes you are the problem, <laughs> but just take it easy. Um, so, Tom, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, and um, it, it's not exactly listening, but it's the idea of where do you put your attention? Um, how are you able to put your attention? I think that this has been a skill that we have lost um, due to the way we've built our economy, um, the different kind of repetitive jobs we've had, and of course, the social media uh, has contributed to that. But your ability to build a, a coherent self, who you are, to have an identity project that you are actually purposely constructing, or to stay with a thought, which is related to the listening that you were thinking about, um, has to do with where your attention goes. And what I think has happened is people have been raised, particularly those who were born in the late 80s, um, have, don't have the skill of, of keeping their attention in a singular place. And then at the same time, we have an entire industry of, of attention architects, you know, attention uh, vamp vampires have your attention. And so you have this, this flightiness to people and it keeps them from feeling um, grounded from having a self that feels like they have a ongoing project that is them or to have outside of them ongoing projects. Uh, so they end up really enjoying the next new video that shows up in their, in their feed. Well, consumers and I think it's, it's hurting us as individuals. I think my son is yeah, really suffering in this way mm. right now. And I've been reading um, Matthew Crawford's book, you know, The World Beyond Your Head, where he sees learning a skill as one of the antidotes to this idea of attention deficit. Um, being grounded in the real world, the physical world, objects are there to give your attention an anchor. Um, and the digital world is not so conducive to that. Thank you. Sorry, I was interrupting um, earlier. Um, we're, we're just, we're, America, the U.S. is the worst example in the world of consumer culture, and it, it kind of ate all our culture. It ate kind of every sector of what, what we think we should aim for as life goals, how we see ourselves, whether we're beautiful or not or worth anything. 
and it, it, and it doesn't benefit consumerism for us to be happy with ourselves and happy with what we have now. So this whole idea about voluntary simplicity or wanting less or having enough or, or plenitude or whatever you want to call it, absolutely um, throws a wrench in the works of consumer economics and the growth of the economy as the measure of health, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, Tom, everything you said was like, you know what, probably the best thing you could do is be happy with who you are and I, I, maybe by, by association with what you've got at this moment and then work from there. Does that run counter to what you're saying or along with? No, it, it runs along with it. And I have to also, like when I talk about this with my son or with other people, um, just to, in the chat a little while ago, I mentioned the book Monoculture, this idea that we have every, every era has an overarching theme that kind of helps you when you're saying, I'm, who are you or why am I going to college? It's like, I'm a guy who has this job or I'm going to get this degree to make money. The idea that economy becomes the concept that helps you define your relationships, who you are, things like that. That's a reality. We can't get away with that. You may not like it, but don't try fighting it. Understand that. <laughs> And so when you're talking to people about helping them craft a meaningful life, you're going to have to use that language. Um, this idea of trying to opt out of that is something that's beyond the control of, of you're not going to change the situation and individuals can't opt out of that. But the vast majority of people need to learn how to live within a system that is dominated by not liberté or fraternité or anything like that. It's dominated by money. Jerry, as a comment on your point about listening, though, um, I just finished reading a book by Van Jones, How We Came Apart and How We Can Come Together, hmm. um, which really tries to sort of signal that this crisis of, of, in essence, what you were saying correctly, of not listening to us brings us to a point where we're forced to listen to each other. And the whole sort of vote for Trump, in my mind, you know, the vote by essentially the flyover America was stop ignoring me, you know, which clearly Hillary uh, Clinton did. In other words, didn't even go to, to Michigan or, you know, places that she should have gone to to have a presence. But, but at the end of the day, the point is that we do need to listen and we need to listen more carefully, more structurally, in other words, in, in ways that are trustworthy. And that, that that process, I think somebody mentioned earlier Otto Sharman and, and you know Sharmer's uh, concept of theory U, which is you know a little bit of mixing the attention, but the openness to a broader attention. In other words, that it's not just what I need; it's what does the system need, so that you can then have a better dialogue. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think one of the most fascinating concepts uh, that I got from Sharma is that leadership is not a function of, well, certainly not a function, of, there's the, you know, there's a notion of heroic leadership, uh, leadership by an individual, but it, leadership is a function of a system. And to me, that's really interesting, especially um, as we're entering more and more the era of, we have a highly... Um, quasi-intelligent tool systems that uh, are working with and which uh, uh, are becoming more and more autonomous. And so we're looking at a situation where it's not only the human system um, that is leading, but there's a kind of ecology of human and tool system, uh, which together uh, leads and creates, you know, just like in Facebook, we're, we're now beginning to study the consequences of, you know, what's happened there. So, uh, I think I found that to be a very useful concept, but the challenge of course is how, you know, we have personal insights, we have personal intentions, and then how do we uh, hold that as a group? And then how do we hold that as a society and as institutions? Because, uh, you know, institutions are sometimes used as a bad word, but you know, one of the comments, actually ironically from David Frum of all people about, uh, you know, Trump is that, that within government institutions are to some extent trying to undermine what he's doing. But that also is dangerous because the institutions are, you know, undermining themselves. They're, you know, they're kind of cheating or going on the side. Sure. So, so that question of how do we institutionalize and systematize 
our intention? That's kind of one way to phrase the question. Totally agree. I'm, I, I'm, I just looked up uh, Donella Meadows' 12 leverage points to intervene in a system, <clears throat> and I'll read the top three in order three, two, one. So uh, the third most powerful way to intervene in a system is the goal of the whole system, change the goal of the system. Number two is the mindset or paradigm that the system, its goals, structures, delays, parameters arises from. And then number one, she writes, power to transcend paradigms, which I'm not sure I understand. Todd, do you want to jump in, say a little more? Uh, you're still muted. No, you're not. Uh, I, I just think that that is a timeless, timeless book. Uh, and I go back to it again and again. Um, I'm, I get chills down my spine when I read it because it feels relevant for uh, nearly any situation. Very wise woman. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, I think, Bill, when you were talking earlier, I, put a, I put a, posted a note in the chat that a lot of what you were saying about how to explore, whether it's in cryptocurrency environments or others, uh, fits nicely uh, Dave Snowden's Kinevin framework about Absolutely. when you're when you're in a complex environment, you don't know cause and effect don't actually marry up well, and right. you need to run a lot of experiments and then uh, react and respond properly when the experiments run. And, and, yeah. and let, let the individual intentions be explored and expressed. In other words, the way he, he does it, it's almost like they begin to to articulate things that they didn't tell anybody else before because he lets their stories tell the, the issues, not some person doing a survey trying to get a yes, no answer. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah, Snowden has so much wisdom. It's really like fascinating. Um, there's all these great names in the chat. There's Meg Wheatley and uh, Surkov, uh, Putin's lieutenant who helped create the fog of war and, all the other things. Um, any concluding thoughts around this topic? Anything you wish we had said or um, things that this conversation has made you want to go dive into more? The biggest, feeling, you know, the biggest challenge ahead. to me is the real community building part of it. In other words, I think that I've personally got sort of at least feelers out there to try and understand the process. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's, it's got to in, somehow engage a two-way com communication. I overheard two millennials talking, saying they just didn't want to get involved at all in politics. And that was so scary. You know, how do you get them to, you know, use their attention? use their their ability to comment to 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 create values yeah it's interesting it, because that is the real <clears throat> challenge so i draw a really big distinction between politics and governance and then also between big g government and little g governance and i don't blame a soul for not wanting to get involved in politics because it's like you know you're basically in the in the sausage factory and it, it, it's not pretty what's happening and and who knows so I can, I can, in some sense, understand what they might have been saying, but I do wish that they wanted to get involved in some form of governance, which they probably don't. Right. Um, but, but to me, if, if they could figure out how to come together with others to, 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 to manage some resource, to make decisions about their own place, to do those kinds of things, that, that's a very large element of the formation of community around things that, that are meaningful. Uh, so we're going to have a pop-up call, a Rex call with a, a friend of mine uh, named Mark Prensky, who's been writing about learning for years. Uh, and one of his role model schools is a school called the Riverside Academy in uh, Ahmedabad. And they have a principle called ICANN. This is like the governing principle of the school. And what they're doing effectively is handing agency to the kids and saying, hey, go fix something in your world. Just, you can, go do it. And, and so they're collecting up stories in a database on the website that, that uh, Mark uh, hosts of, of kids in different classes, different age groups, different cohorts, different cities around the world, because this is spread across India, it's spread to other places, uh, of, of kids going out in the world and fixing stuff. And then 
one of one of my main critiques of school is that it's a it's this artificial petri dish where we lift kids out of society and we don't let their actions have any consequence on their lives. So this flips that exactly, and it's it's a, it's a nice example of of the kind of thing that can uh, that can lead to some productive outcomes. So we'll we'll have a, a pop up Rex call. Uh, I think it's next Tuesday uh, with Mark around this. Any other wrapping thoughts on this topic? Bill, I think you're going to want to have like kind of an addictive component to the community building piece, you know, so. Like sprinkle, sp sprinkle cinnamon and jujubes on it? Yeah, <laughs> a lot of sugar or something, or, or maybe you could just include likes and stuff. So. I, I think like a little button, a little button that when you press it, it gives you a little bit of like <laughs> opioid <laughs> solution. Feedback, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Facebook right. will tell you who you talk to. Any other thoughts? Um, with that, let us let us wrap the first uh, Rex call of the of the new year of 2018. And uh, good luck to everybody. See you online, and, and thank you very much for for being here. Really appreciate thank you. it. All right, thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye.